and happy Canada Day. Make sure I have that thing there. There you go. Now, I remember that time when my family and I arrived at Pearson Airport in April 2007. Irene was 14 years old then. Kyra was 12. And we were sent by GCF Philippines to do church planting here in Canada. The interesting thing was that it was Attorney Abbe who picked us up and brought us to our first ever meal in Canada. Where? Where? <laughs> Suspense. Oh, I have to turn this on. Okay. That's the first lesson in preaching. The f where? More, more, more. Tim Horton, Mandarin, Swishale. Yeah, that's his favorite, but... <laughs> but we went to KFC in Scarborough, near our house. That's the actual picture of that branch along Shepherd and Kennedy. A month after our arrival, we were witnesses to the launch of GCF Toronto on Mother's Day. So what a beautiful memory for my family and for me. So here's what I'm wondering about this morning. Do you remember the year, the month, maybe even the day you arrived in Canada? Wow. Wow. She remembers. October 17, 1994. June 30, 2009. All oh, right. Wow. Very nice. Congratulations. We're celebrating your anniversary. So we invited Lex from the Philippines. Ah, no, no, I'm joking. He's visiting with us, and we're glad that you both are here. Uh, whether you came here by yourself or whether you came with your family, do you remember your first meal? Your first home? Your special memory about your first month in Canada. Now, some probably recall in detail, like I was able to do, but for some, vaguely. But whatever our experiences were, whether positive or negative in coming here, the important thing is that God brought you here. Whatever be the original intent in coming to Canada. Here's the beautiful truth. God has a plan for us in Canada without forgetting that God had a plan for us in the Philippines before we left or in the other countries where God led us to before bringing us to Canada. For those of you who came here as a child, for those of you who came here as a youth, and for those of you who were born here because you're originally from here, let me share with you that God also has a beautiful plan for you, whatever be your age or stage in your life right now. As Paul said very beautifully, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. I hope we understand and claim that today, that God has a good purpose for you in the midst of whatever you're going through. Whatever struggle your family is going through, God has a good purpose for you. The assurance of this good purpose for you and your family is true also for the good purpose that God has for us together at GCF Peel. So kindly tell the person beside you, God has a plan for you. That is so true. In fact, that plan is the unpacking the unfolding of his grand purpose, not just for you, not just for your family, but on a bigger scale. As we celebrate in Canada, God is the God of Canada. He has a good purpose for Canada. God has a good purpose for the Philippines. God has a good purpose for all the nations because God is the God of all nations. Now, as you already know, Canada is a country of ethnic and cultural diversities with various backgrounds, with various beliefs. 
And I think it will continue to do so. More newcomers will be arriving here, more immigrants, more migrants, more students, even though they put a cap on the students, and more asylum seekers, bringing more ethnic and cultural diversity. Now, cultural diversity has its strengths, but it also has its challenges. So in the context of this kind of cultural ethnic diversity, we can become better citizens and residents of Canada when we are sowing seeds of radical compassion. That's important, that wherever God has placed us, in our home, in our neighborhood, in our workplace, in our school, that is the place that God can bring us to show radical compassion. So we will learn that we can start this process of growth by sowing seeds that prepares for new life. Life that we have not seen in the past years or for some decades of being here in Canada. That there is something fresh as a beginning that God has for us as a family. It's not just same old, same old business as usual life as a family. Or not just the same old things we do in church. Or the same old political situation in Canada. We can show radical compassion whatever our context is today. And we're basing our study from the Gospel of Luke, where Jesus expresses so many gestures of radical compassion. In fact, not just showing expressions of radical compassion, he is teaching a lot about this topic. By radical, let me clarify what I mean. We mean something that is not usual. We mean something that is not traditional. We mean something that is different and maybe even intense. And for some, it may be extreme. By compassion, this is what we mean. We mean something that comes from deep inside of us. It's something that springs forth from the core of our being. It is feeling with people. Compassion is feeling for people. Not just with people, but for people. So that our attitudes toward others are gracious, our attitudes toward them are generous. That our actions, not just our attitudes toward them, are for their good. Just as God is gracious and generous to us, just as God is always doing what is good for us. As you may recall, our theme for 2024 is harvest of hope, sowing seeds of love and compassion. We are looking forward to a harvest of hope this year. But we realize that to be able to do this, we need to begin with sowing seeds. Two kinds of seeds. Seeds of love, seeds of compassion. In the first half of this year, we looked at what hope looked like. That hope is unwavering. That hope leads to flourishing. We also looked at how we can sow seeds of love toward God. Because if we begin sowing seeds of love to others, where will that love come from? So we need to begin with sowing seeds of love toward God. And we did a study on worship through the different doxologies found in the book of Revelation. Now for this series. As we enter into the second half of 2024, we are going to sow seeds, not just of hallelujah love for God, but for radical compassion for others. We know that when we love God, God leads us to love others also. The more we sow seeds of hallelujah love to God, the more we will sow seeds of radical love to others. Loving God and loving our neighbor, they always go together, like two sides of the same coin. So what will we discuss today? We will learn how to sow seeds of radical love by exercising radical non-judgment. No. Let me ask you, don't answer. Only in your heart. Are you the kind of person who casts judgment on others? Now, if you say yes in your heart, no judgment here. But here's what we'd like to discover. What does God say about judging others? We will learn what it is, because sometimes we say no judgment, not judgmental, but what does it really mean? 
is what we understand about it, what the Bible means. So we will look at what it means and what it doesn't mean. We will use Luke 6, the passage read for us earlier by Brother Jay, beginning with verse 37 all the way to verse 42, and they will teach us how we can demonstrate radical non-judgment as a way of life, not just today, a life that will lead us to compassion daily. Are you ready? Yeah, yeah, one is ready. Are you excited to learn this? Yes. Yeah, this side is? What about this side? I'm not judging you either, but, but let's be excited to learn two truths about how can we be radically non-judgmental. Here's the first. By the way, as we go along, it might sting, but sting is good. Non-judgment spares us from being judged ourselves. Very important principle that we will look at. Non-judgment is clearly taught by Jesus. Is it really good not to judge? Yes, because Jesus said, don't do it. Listen to what he said. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Very clear. I mean, do you need anything more clearer than that? But do we understand what it means? In the previous context, immediately before verse 37, we can see that being merciful is an evidence of not being judgmental. Listen to the words of verse 36. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. So we ask the question, how can we be merciful just as our Heavenly Father is merciful? The answer? Do not judge. I hope we get that. Mercy is seen in our life when we do not judge people. Mercy and non-judgment they go together. But I'd like for us to get this. There are at least three things that not judging others does not mean. Let me go to the first. First, to not judge does not mean forgetting what is right and wrong, what is good and bad. In fact, in the succeeding context of our passage, we see that Jesus differentiates the results springing from a good person and an evil person. Listen to these words. A good man brings good things out of the good stored in his heart. An evil man brings evil things stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So what does this verse say to us? To not judge does not mean that we forget categories that constitute what is good and what is bad. It's still important to be able to discern the difference between the two. Here's the second that to not, ju to not judge does not mean. It does not mean that we ignore holiness. That it's okay for us whether people live lives that are holy or unholy. We probably think, I won't intrude into their choice of lifestyle because it doesn't matter to us if they're holy or not. My question is, is that what not judging means? My answer is, no. But it seems that that may be what even other Christians may want from us when they tell us, don't judge me. But when we listen to Luke chapter 17, also in the teaching of Jesus, listen to what Jesus says. This may sting, but, but it's important to listen to this. Verses 3 to 4. So watch yourselves. Very important. Watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins, sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day, and seven times comes back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. What? Note the four-part process in these verses. We watch ourselves that we may ourselves not fall into sin. Second, we rebuke the offending brother or sister. We address the offense. We address the offender. 
Third, we forgive them when they repent from their sins. And then, this is the hardest part. We repeatedly forgive as they repeatedly sin against us and repeatedly repent from their repeated sins. Oh, my foot. That's too much. There's even another episode when Peter asked Jesus, how many times shall I forgive my brother? Seven times? Seven times for Peter is already gracious and generous. Because in the law, you are to forgive someone three times. On the fourth, you don't have to forgive. This guy was doubling his ability and capacity to forgive for good measure. Plus one, for better measure. But Jesus says, no, forgive how many times? 70 times 7. It doesn't mean that the, on the 491st time, we don't forgive. The point is, it becomes a habit of life that we keep forgiving. What if they keep on sinning? We keep forgiving. Is there a quota for us not to forgive? Does God have a quota for us when we sin? Huh, this is hard. The point of this process is that holiness and the lack of holiness should matter to us. Because continuing in unholiness does not give any good to anybody, whether the offender or the offended. So to say that holiness or unholiness in us, in others, does not matter because we do not judge people is not what it means not to judge people. Get it? Okay, some didn't get it. Get it? Good. Third, to not judge does not mean that we will throw our minds out of the window and that our thinking be put to neutral or to even say goodbye to any kind of logical or rational reasoning. It does not also mean that we do not assess things well, nor do we evaluate people well. In fact, we are told in Scripture to do the opposite. Do you realize that? To make right and wise judgments. Listen to what Jesus says. This is Jesus again speaking in John 7. Stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. Wow. Maybe some of you didn't hear that before. Jesus says, judge correctly. I thought, do not judge. We're called to evaluate. We're called to assess well. Even John, the beloved disciple of Jesus, said this. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to, what, to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. To test means to evaluate. To test means to assess. So if forgetting what's good or bad is not what it means to ju not judge others, and if ignoring a holy or unholy life is not what it also means, and if it's not throwing our mind out of the window, then what does not judging mean? I'm glad you asked. This is what it means. It means not condemning others from a judgmental heart. Not condemning others from a judgmental heart. In September 2007, a research was done by the Barna Research Group entitled, A New Generation Expresses Its Skepticism and Frustration with Christianity. The title itself is very revealing. The study was conducted among young people ages 16 to 29 in the U.S., here is the overwhelming and sobering result of the study. Buckle up. They said 90% think that Christians are judgmental. What? This opinion is reflected in a book that was written based on this study. Kinnaman and Lyons said, being judgmental is fueled by self-righteousness. 
the misguided inner motivation to make our own life look better by comparing it to the lives of others. That is based on the result of the study. Now, my thought is this. Isn't it ironic that we who are told by Jesus not to judge others are perceived to be overwhelmingly judgmental by youth and young adults. Isn't that ironic? Let it sink for a while. That stinks. Maybe that stinks. I wonder why we are seen as judgmental. Whether the opinion is valid or not, whether the opinion is fair or not, that's not my point. That's not the takeaway of the study. The point for us this morning is to make us reflect, to make us pause, and ask the question, how have we been showing symptoms of being judgmental. And may God give us insight to answer that question so that we may catch ourselves before we are tempted to judge others. When we return to our passage, we see Jesus giving four commands as if do not judge is not enough. He gives four commands that follow the sow and reap principle of life, relationships, and ministry. Four commands in succession. Don't judge. Don't condemn. Forgive. Give. And it is summarized at the end, giving the principle behind the four commands. Listen to that principle. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. It's a good word of caution. If you judge this way, that's how you will be judged by others too. Very beautiful. Causes us to pause. Causes us to reflect. To hold our tongue and thought before we judge. This so and reap principle, or what we can probably call the measure and be measured principle, are seen in these words. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you know what follows, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. That's the sow and reap principle. The measure and be measured principle. Note that in the first two commands, they are put in the positive. Do not judge. Do not condemn. The principle still works there. Now, if you look at the last two commands, forgive and give, they're put in the positive. The principle also works there. Whether it's put in the negative or whether it's put in the positive, they both work there. And what helps me to describe what not being judgmental means is also specified in these verses. We are not judgmental when we do not condemn. Get it? Let me say that. We are not judgmental when we do not condemn. So this one relates to the next one. It also tells us that we are not judgmental when we forgive. It also means that we are not judgmental when we give. Wow. Very rich. They are all interrelated. What is even fascinating to me is that this principle is being rewarded bountifully if we do the principle every day. 
when these four gestures generate great results generously. These results are usually seen in relation to giving. You, you, you see the connection, right? I get that. Because the immediate context says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, press down, shake it together, running over, will be poured to your lap. I get it. Immediate context. Give and you will get this overflowing, generous result. That makes sense. But here's my proposal. It also makes sense that the overflowing fruits are not just the result of giving, but also the results of not judging, of not condemning, and forgiving. Listen to these words. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be poured into your lap. Being merciful, being generous to others is done by not judging. Being merciful, being generous to others is done by not condemning. Being merciful and generous to others is being done by forgiving. Being merciful and generous to others is being done specially by giving. This will yield abundant, amazing results. If we extend this sow and reap principle, this is what we can say. When we sow generously, we reap generously. We cannot expect to be sowing this much and expecting that the result of the reaping is this much. It doesn't work that way. We reap what we sow. If we reap or we sow generously in non-judgment attitude, we will reap generously in a non-judgment attitude. If we, if we sow judgmentally, we will reap judgmentally. We can picture the image of good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over in two ways. I was looking for a container at home, but this is the only container I found, the container for the food of the dogs. So imagine with me, you're in the first century, and, and you're going to market, and, and you have a container. So when you buy grain in the marketplace, what you do, you open your container, and then you pour the grain. Before you pour some more, you press the grain inside. And after you press, you shake it. So the grain still settles down. And then you pour some more. And then you press it. And then you shake it until it is full. And then it overflows. That's a picture of what it means to have good measure. Press down, shaken together, running over. Now, why is there the word will be poured into your lap? Let me give you the other picture. The other picture is that you know the way. So that is the first picture. The second picture is that you know that people in the Middle East, Mediterranean world, wear robes. Now, assuming this is part of a person's robe. And it usually goes all the way to the bottom. Okay? I have my belt. And so, assuming that this is a robe from top to bottom, and let me put my robe up down here, and I'm having difficulty putting my belt because of the, le the size of my waist. Okay. So, Assuming this is now my robe, and I want to buy grain in the marketplace, what do I do? I don't have a container. I will use my robe. Exactly. I will go to the bottom of my robe, do it like this, do the same thing. Pour the grain, press it, shake it. The little shaking, like this. 
shake it until it runs over. And that's why the picture, if you look at the verse, it says, will be poured into your lap. Why that picture? Because of the rope. Of the grain being poured into your lap. This is uncomfortable. <laughs> but you get the point. In both images, the container and the grain, the lower part of the robe and the grain, we see a vivid picture of how God provides in good measure. And how God abundantly gives to us so much more than what we have given to others. So much more. God gives a good measure, abundantly, generously blessing us and gives us mercy so much more than the frequency of our forgiving others. That's amazing. God pours out so much more love upon us than the frequency of our not judging others and not condemning them. My friends, since God is like this, let's not be judgmental. Remember, when we judge others, we too will be judged by the same measure we judge. So far, we've seen the first truth of radical non-judgment. We will be spared from being judged ourselves. Let's go to the second and last one. Non-judgment spares us from hypocrisy. Wow, it's getting heavier. Getting more serious. Jesus compares non-judgment to an exaggerated story. It's called the hyperbole. Exaggerated in English, exage. <laughs> he uses this language. The story of looking at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and paying no attention to the plank, a log or a plank of wood in your eye. That's exage. We see their speck of sawdust. We don't see our own plank, our own log, in our own eye. Jesus asked two rhetorical questions. Piercing. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank or log in your own eye? First question. Second question. How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourself failed to see the plank in your own eye. This is enough to make us pause, to make us reflect. They show the absurdity of judging others. When we ourselves have larger issues of life, of life like a log or plank, that we need to first deal with. Listen to what Jesus calls the person who judges others. You know the name of that person who judges? You hypocrite. Oh my foot. You hypocrite. The term hypocrite is a word used in the Greek stage play. At the time of Jesus, stage actors played several roles because of the scarcity of actors. So the audience, to not be confused about the person playing several roles, the person had to wear a mask. Jesus calls those who judge others as hypocrites who wear masks to hide the real condition of their heart. One evidence that shows the real condition of the heart of a 
hypocritical judge is the mask of self-righteousness. Jesus highlights this evidence in the self-righteousness of a Pharisee compared to the humility and repentance of a tax collector through a parable. I'd like for you to watch and learn. Maybe you've heard this before, but let it sink into your heart. Don't, don't question it. Just receive it. Jesus says, two men went up to a temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. I wonder if we can identify with the description of the self-righteous and self-exalting Pharisee. If we can, in what ways do we show it in the way we speak, in the way we think, in the way we act? When we identify what these things are, may we be like the tax collector in his humility and repentance so that we may experience what it is to be exalted by God and to not be humiliated by God. That's scary. To be humiliated by others, maybe we can take that for others, we may not. But think, if God humiliates us, no one can take that. Don't go that path. But is there a way to get out of judging others if we are in it? Or is there a way to avoid it when we're not in it? How can we avoid being self-righteous? How can we avoid self-exaltation? There's a way. In fact, when we return to Luke 6, we see what Jesus tells the hypocritical judge of others. Very direct. Jesus says, first, he's saying, this can be done if you do this. First, take the plank out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. There is room to help the brother take the speck out, but not as the first step. Take your plank out first, and then you can see clearly. Note that when we take out the plank in our own eye, we can have the moral ascendancy to take the speck in the eye of others. Paul also says the same thing. He gives a clear command in Romans 10 for Christians not to judge one another. Listen, let this enter your heart and mind. Very directly, he says, you then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Second question, why do you treat them with contempt? For we will stand before God's judgment seat. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. So my question is this. What is it that puts a mutual stumbling block a mutual obstacle in our way as Christ followers? The answer? Judging one another. Here's my appeal as a pastor to you, as I say this to myself, as I pastor myself. Let's not fall into the trap of living hypocritically. 
can we stop judging one another? Another sobering research, this time conducted in Canada, was done in 2012. It was sponsored by the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada entitled Hemorrhaging Faith, Why and When Young, Why and When Canadian Young Adults Are Leaving, Staying, and Returning to the Church. Two basic questions were asked. First, to what degree do young adults in Canada today stick with or drop their religious faith? Second question. What keeps them in the faith and what helps them to usher them out? Here are three significant findings. Only one in three Canadian young adults who attended church weekly as a child still does so today. One out of three, 33%. The others, the two-thirds, they left church. The second finding of those who no longer attend church, the two-thirds, one half of the two-thirds have stopped identifying with their childhood Christian tradition. It has nothing to do with me. You know what they're called? Dons. D-O-N-E-S. I'm done with church. The third is that the youth and young adults in Canada identified four toxins that keep young people from church, allergic to church. First, hypocrisy. Second, judgment. Third, exclusivity. Fourth, failure. Note that they have cited hypocrisy and judgment as the first two. We discussed in the first point, judgment we're discussing in the second point, hypocrisy. They get it. Sometimes we don't. My question to us this morning, does hypocrisy and being judgmental affect GCFP? This Canadian research is another sobering reality, not just for, Can for the U.S., but also among our first-generation Filipino-Canadians among us. May we have the courage to ask ourselves, how is our modeling of the faith in the presence of the next generations, whether these emerging generations come from a family or from this church family, as first-generation Filipino-Canadians, how is our modeling to our next generation like? Do we show attitudes of self-righteousness and acts of self-exaltation? Are we hypocritical and even judgmental to the younger ones? If we are showing these things to you, I'm talking now to our next generation, our youth and young adults, would you forgive us? May we not be a stumbling block or obstacle to your way as Christ followers. And for the rest of us, for all of us, may we heed the command of Jesus to first take the plank out of our own eye. May we also not judge one another, but instead show radical love and radical compassion, knowing that not judging others spares us from hypocrisy and it spares us from being judged ourselves. And here's my last thing before we close. Let's remember Jesus, who did not judge the woman caught in adultery, who didn't judge the woman in Samaria who had five husbands, and who did not judge the thief 
crucified with him on the cross. And who does not judge you and me? Lord, thank you for Jesus. He is our model of what it means not to judge others, not to condemn them, but to forgive and to give. Thank you for how he did this on the cross. And because of his radical love and radical compassion, forgiving even at the cross, a thief who humbles himself and repents. May we remember Jesus, who does not judge us. Would you give us the grit and the grace not to judge others the way you don't judge us? Amen.